Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to reporters here on France 24. In this edition, how French families and businesses are trying to help migrants. We meet three families working to give migrants a brighter and better future. It's very much a different picture to the one typically painted by the headlines and by the anti-migrant rhetoric of certain politicians. The European Commission declared the migrant crisis to be over in March 2019. But migrants continue to risk their lives to reach Europe. Our film shows migrants desperate to build a better future, and French people equally keen to help. This reports by Damien Le Fauconnier and Lisa Louis. I'm tired today, can you tell? I have no appetite either. I can't bring myself to eat. No, but I need you to hang on. If you fall ill too, we won't be able to get through this. Yaya worries about Patricia. The agricultural worker and baker hasn't eaten for six days. She's only been drinking coffee and tea. She now often feels dizzy. I'm so angry, but I don't feel like yelling out loud. I just want the world to see my state of mind. I really want to help Yaya, and I don't know what else to do. Patricia is on hunger strike. She's fighting for the right to keep on her Guinean apprentice Yaya. He arrived in France aged 16 and was allowed to become a trainee at Patricia's farm near Lyon in eastern France. But two years ago, when Yaya turned 18, he had to cut his training short and was told he'd have to leave the country. However, he'd be difficult to replace. Several French candidates came knocking on our door, but they only stayed for a few days. This lifestyle is just too tough on them. Work days that can go on for 15 or 16 hours put other candidates off. But Yaya has learned to love the work here, especially at the farm's bakery. Go on then, Yaya, cut the dough for the 500 gram bread. And then you shape them as usual. Henri Pierre happily shows Yaya the ropes, but the current situation is weighing on him. We need help. I don't know what to say anymore. It brings tears to my eyes. I'm sorry. I don't even understand why there are borders and barriers. Why would you stop Yaya from working for us? If that's what he wants to do, why would you do that? Even though he's not allowed to work at the moment, Yaya still comes to visit them twice a week. After four years of shared life, he got attached to them, also to Marie, Patricia's daughter. I still remember when you first got here. You just couldn't keep still. Now you seem calm and settled. At the time, Yaya still believed things would turn out all right. But the past two years haven't been easy. All I can do now is wait. I used to come here every Sunday and Monday to learn the recipes. But I know them now and could actually help with the work. If only the government let me. But I don't have the right to work. Yaya has found refuge at a charity. In exchange for work, he gets lodging and food. And he's trying to fight back through a collective that he started together with two other Guineans, Muni and Zakaria, who also had to cut short their apprenticeship when they turned 18. We studied as we were asked to. We got through our exams and we received our certificates of professional competence. I've learned French and live with a French family that's trying to adopt me, so far to no avail. My future lies in France. The future of all the members of our collective lies in France. 
Yaya doesn't like speaking about his long struggles in Africa. He had to walk across the continent, was sold as a slave in Libya and rescued in the Mediterranean Sea together with other migrants after being forced to flee from his village at the age of 14. There was a lot of violence in the family and especially concerning my family was quite violent, especially towards me. They invented a whole scenario and told the entire village that I was opposed to religion. I had to flee to save my life. Yes, by stoning. I called the prefecture this morning. I told them, this isn't a joke. You need to give me an answer now. I haven't eaten for seven days. This is getting really urgent. Fifteen days later, Patricia has lost seven kilos but won the fight. The authorities have decided to grant Yaya the right to stay in France and complete his apprenticeship. They're smashing everything. It's disgusting. The migrants get here with practically nothing. And the police destroy what they have left. There's no dignity, no humanity. The video Anne-Sophie and Laurent are watching shows the evacuation of a migrant camp in Grand Sainte, where they are heading. The police regularly come back to destroy the tents in their vans officers patrol around the camp, located in a woody area. We're arriving at the camp of Grande Sainte. We'll take a few of them with us, but we can't take everybody along. There's not enough space. Salam. Hundreds of migrants, most of them Iraqi Kurds or Iranians, have set up camp in the forest, just a few hundred meters away from nearby homes. They all want to cross the English Channel, Conditions are harsh. Laurent is taking stock of the damage after the police operation. The place resembles a garbage dump. Look at that, a clean blanket that's been thrown in the river. And Sophie and Laurent take a few migrants along to their car. It's filled with coats, trousers, pullovers and plastic sheets, bought with online donations. Entire families live at the camp. Laurent is furious. This is the second evacuation within a week. How dare they destroy a child's shelter, crush his toys and clothes in the mud? It's absurd. Laurent is chatting with Zari from Iraq. He's laughing off the abuse he suffered since arriving in Europe. France, very, very good. Police, no good. <laughs> People, France, very, very good. Police, no good. Politic, no good. Politic no good, police no good. Zari hasn't seen his wife or his baby in the past two months. The family had managed to get through to the UK, but he was then caught by police and sent back to Sweden. Zari, give me a number. Laurent doesn't hesitate to give out his number. All the migrants save it in their phone. They are so, so hell of us. Uh, with the tent, with the blanket, with the food. That's a night, uh, this jungle is so, so cold for us. Right. Laurent has been helping migrants for 25 years. He comes here every week. What he does doesn't always go down well with the locals. We need to be careful. A year ago, a man drove past me so close that he hit me with his rearview mirror on purpose. All these racists don't want us to help the migrants. When there was still the so-called jungle, that huge camp, some people would chase me on the highway to try to push me off the road. Laurent has been unemployed for a year now. He used to work as a cleaner and says he was laid off because he's helping migrants. He uses his home as a base and builds heaters to help the migrants. That will keep them warm and they can prepare proper food. If they put their pan on a log, it's not stable and the food falls on the ground. Come back! This is a typical evening for Laurent. He's talking to a couple who used to stay with him. They made it through to London. Laurent lives here with his wife and two sons. At the moment, they have opened their doors to an Iranian father and his daughter. 
They want to join family members in England. We got here illegally. The journey was very difficult and stressful. In Croatia, the police treated us really badly. There was another migrant with me, and we were all beaten by the police. They took our money, our clothes, and deported us to Bosnia. His 17-year-old daughter tried to cross the channel with the help of smugglers five months ago, but a few kilometers off the coast, their boat capsized. Well, I have a problem uh, with my ears because uh, the weather is so cold and uh, I, I, I was so scared and I don't want to try again, but um, I must try. <laughs> I, I must close my eyes and... Uh, you, know, you know swimming? No, <laughs> I can't. Laurent has been helping migrants since he was a teenager, after seeing how some of them were forced to live in the streets. That left him deeply shocked. In 2018, he was given a six-month suspended prison sentence after helping three Iranians to cross the channel. But he doesn't regret what he did. I gave them life jackets, a GPS, a compass, flares. They had everything they needed. Yes, they did. 10,000 migrants tried to cross the channel in 2020. Six of them died, three disappeared in the sea. The first day here was the worst. I'd never gone through anything like this. I woke up in the morning and I didn't know how to brush my teeth or where to find food. I only had one pair of trousers. I couldn't wash them because if I did, I didn't have anything to wear. Okay. This young Malian is reflecting on his first few months living in a tent here near Gare du Nord in Paris. We call him Ali, which isn't his real name. He's afraid the government might expel him. His papers show that he was 15 years old when he first arrived in France. He thought his age would mean he'd get off the street, but it didn't. The judge didn't believe that I was underage. It's really weird. I have official papers, my passport, and I know many minors who, like me, had to live on the streets. Three years on from when he got to France, Ali still doesn't have residence papers, but he's one of the lucky ones. He now lives in a small room. This is my desk. It's where, after school, I do my homework. This is where I put my school supplies, my backpack and my clothes. It's not very tidy. You're a young person like any other. But it's my desk. <laughs> You've even got a real window. We knocked down the wall of the laundry room, so we don't have a laundry room anymore. But at least he has some privacy. Ali has been staying in the apartment for a year and a half now. Now, well, Aziz and their children have taken him in. Ali has his own key. He eats and spends his free time with them. Which pizza would you prefer? Four cheese or four cheese? Uh, four cheese. <laughs> Nawel works as a lawyer, Aziz as a train driver. When they heard about migrants who are minors, they wanted to help. A charity put them in touch with Ali. On a vu même des, uh, des femmes seules qui recevaient des jeunes et, uh, et du coup voilà c'est vrai que c'est rassurant. There are even single women who take in minors. It's quite encouraging to talk to people who say that they were also a bit scared at first, but that then everything went well. Ces jeunes mineurs isolés au lieu de dormir dans la rue. At least I can help some of these miners who otherwise would have to stay outside. It costs me nothing. A few months after Ali's arrival, the youngest family member was born and Ali celebrated his 18th birthday. These young people are really timid at first. They observe things and ask lots of questions for a while before really taking part in family life. They're really trying not to disturb and ask before entering a room. They're so respectful and integrate really well into family life. It's not my fault, I'm not the weatherman. I didn't make it rain. Aziz says he sees Ali like his son. He now goes to school and has joined a group that's helping homeless people. 
What's that? Omelette? Potatoes? Potato tortillas. Do you have a bag I can put it in? Oh, we forgot the plastic bags. Ali always makes sure he's there. I went along twice or three times. Then I told them, whenever you go to see the homeless, you call me. <laughs> Aziz doesn't think of himself as exceptional. He feels it's normal to help isolated miners and spend free time helping the homeless. I don't think I'm a good Samaritan. I'm just being humane. And as a human being, you give and you take. That's what solidarity is about. People need to help each other out. Now that he's no longer a miner, Ali's future lies in the hands of the government and its goodwill. A report there by Damien Le Fauconnier and Lisa Louis. You can see it again via our website, france24.com. This is Reporters. Thank you for watching. Stay with us. Most of all, do stay safe.